Um, so can you start us out here and kind of set the stage? How old are you when you decide, um, when you make the move, the transition into Vietnam? And, you know, you're in Germany at the time, right? I was in Munich, Germany, working for a uh, outfit. It was called the General Collection Division, and it was it was uh, the in 1968 um, they had that freedom train break that the Czechs or the Russians used to have the barricaded tracks that was the end of the going into the other end, and they had this freedom train in '68 that broke out of Czechoslovakia, and, and there was only one place in Europe where they did this kind of stuff, and and like there was German nationals and. Uh, Czechs and Bulgarians and um, just people that got out and then they'd you know shake them down for information and stuff and same thing I was writing rewriting reports of um, guys that couldn't hardly speak English let alone write it you know so I'd get them in there and I got to know some guys it was it was kind of fun but um, I got to know a couple guys over there and one of them was a, a gunship pilot who just Really, he thought I was out of my mind when I told him I was volunteering to go over there, and because I'd listened to his um, experience, and and it wasn't a good one, but um, I don't know. I just I don't know what it was. If it was, um, I don't know. Maybe it was patriotism. I just felt like I had to see what's going on, and then, like I started to tell you, on the way over there, we stopped in Japan. You know, and everybody going over there, there wasn't a hundred words said on the flight, you know. Nobody talked to nobody about nothing. And everybody was strangers. And um, when we got to Japan, we ran into a plane full of guys that were going home. And the first thing they thought was, oh, my goodness sake. You know, these guys were, I thought, they're letting these guys go back to the States like this, you know? <laughs> and there really, there was no, when you got, and the thing is, everybody looked at these guys like, wow. And um, the thing is, it didn't take 60 days and everybody looked and acted just like that. It was a culture that, uh, it was a, to me anyway, to me, it was a culture of, um, It's a culture of the uh, military higher ups deceiving the American public and the Vietnam soldiers of what we were trying to do over there. I've read enough books to know that the only reason we stayed over there was Johnson wanted to get reelected. I read a book that said that, and I believe that. But then in that next year, he got so much shit, he just said, I'm not going to do this no more. And I think that's exactly what happened, you know. I think it's just a big, well, you know, we hadn't had a war since Korea, you know, that was, but. So when you were, were there, what exactly was your responsibility? What were you there to do? What I did is I um, handled incident reports, primarily. Primarily incident reports. I handled them. They'd come in from the, we had eight or nine provinces in our three core area. And the stuff would come in to me, and then I'd forward it, and they'd, I'd get it back, and then I'd go here or there. You never, um, Air America, I don't know how much you know about them, but they're a bunch of crooks too. You know, CIA and country, they were, they were undermining us as over there. But anyway, I'd meet those guys, and sometimes. I wouldn't know, well, most of the time, I wouldn't know where, what landing strip I was going to meet him at, you know. And I had a, I had a panel van for a vehicle. I ran all over the place with that thing. Just uh, put a lot of miles on it. Went to a lot of strange places. Saw, saw some str strange things. And so you're doing incident reports? And you're doing, and then you're going and you're checking out these various places. No, I, I'm not checking them out. Going to see Before the people. Start. Can I? I'm gonna move your seat over just a. Okay. Foot. That's all right. Okay. 
Um, so, so you get these incident reports, and you're passing these reports on, and then you're and then I'm getting them back. Uh huh. Okay. They get they go through a chain of command of a E8, a colonel, and an ambassador. That supposedly was supposedly was my chain of command. And um, then I'd get them back. I might get them back in a day or, you know, but I'd get them back. And then the, the whoever up there um, lists what province and who else other than that per person has privy to the information. And if it's like um, four people or two people, the province chief and the military advisor on our end, um, that's how many copies that go out, and then everybody that touched these things had to sign them, and then they got a torn off copy, but everybody signed for for their stuff. And you said that they would come back different mm -hmm. than how you had sent them. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was, unless there was, unless, of course, it was a pretty boring report, you know, and there's more boring reports than not, but, you know, I, I'd hear, hear about incident reports First hand from guys, because um, I heard a lot of incident reports because we were what they considered a rear echelon base. We, our um, unit, I was working for MACV headquarters in Saigon, and um, I don't know. I got my DD two fourteen, and they said I, uh, I worked for advisory teams in 95 and 96 and 97. I, I didn't know that until I got out. <laughs> just the way it is, you know. It's just the way it was. Crazy. And But you're working in intelligence. Mm -hmm. But I'm just a gopher boy. I'm not a guy that's up there telling Westmoreland what to do, you know. I'm just... But a, you're, 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 you're getting a sense I'm, of... The flow of, yeah, of everything. and then what people are telling me, people that have been there or people I run into and stuff, they just reassure me, reassure me, you know, of what I see, you know, and what I see is the higher ups in the military deceiving or out sometimes just lying to their underlings just to keep things going, you know. Um, no, I, I came out of the military with a terrible attitude. I, uh, Talk about that. How, because you, of your vantage point, that was a pretty unique position. Yeah, yeah. every day I drove through a, a major village to get from where we stayed to where we worked. And uh, yeah, it was a good vantage point. There was a biggest air, air base in, um, Vietnam, Benoit Air Force Base was there also. I drove by there every day when I, when I, yeah, every day. And uh, your lesson was? My lesson? Yeah. My lesson was don't believe everything you see and hear. You know, we're over there and a lot of the people that the press over in the U.S. is demonizing, you know, the hippies and all this shit, you know. There's a lot of guys over there who have been with, right with that movement. And what the hell are we doing here? You know, but it didn't work out that way. Just, and then boom, you're back. You go on your back, and you wonder what the hell happened. What was that all about? So I spent, um, I spent the better part of forty years just not thinking about it. There was, I wasn't attached to anything or anybody. Um, when I went there or when I came home, I just, uh, I don't know, I just wanted to get, once I got there, I wanted to, I was in no hurry to, I mean, I wasn't in no big deal to stay there, I can tell you that. I'd seen enough after three or four months that to know what goes on. So, do you think there is something that other people do not understand about Vietnam veterans. I mean... That they don't understand? I mean, is there a defining characteristic about the men and women 
who came through that Vietnam experience, the veterans? You mean what it was like after getting out? Or yeah. I mean, what how I brought Vietnam home with me? Yeah. Well, um, I don't know. I wasn't very nice to anybody for a long time. Um, I didn't even go home for about six weeks after I got home. And I was a family boy. I was a Catholic family boy before that, you know. The most goofy thing I ever did was like, you know, drinking and jumping off a bridge and a river or something like that, you know. But it was just amazing for me just to realize just, just how crazy things had become in what the American public, Stars and Stripes, the biggest propaganda sheet that was over there. It's all they did was make it seem like Hey, you're going home or winning the war, and then everything else over there is, and we ain't winning nothing. We don't even know what the hell we're fighting for. And I think that's the way it got at the end. I don't think anybody knew what they were fighting for. They just wanted to get home. Some guys came home and went into things like law enforcement. Some people did some good things in their life. Not me. I wrecked a couple of marriages and owned a couple of bars and lived a bar life for 30 years. And sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's all the things I thought I missed out on. What does the group, the people that you meet with, what does that do for you now? It puts me at ease. I feel comfortable. I feel safe. I feel there's like, the, and, and I don't know how many years ago now, but a few years ago, um, I didn't feel that way. It took going back and going back, but there's nobody in that place. There's, believe me, there's nobody in our room that would be in there by default. Jim and shake them down. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think you and the whole group of men that I've had an opportunity to meet with are Amazing. Amazing. What's well, amazing to amazing me is... Amazing that you all survived. Amazing we all got together 45 years later, you know. It was, you know, that was a long thing. People used to tell me to go to the VA because they knew I was a mess, you know, but I, you know, I just totally blew it off. It was easy to do, blow it off, you know. Stay high and get by and pretty soon 40 years go by. And that's what happened to me. I'm not proud of it, it's just what happened, you know. Do you think it is, do you think that there's still something to learn about the Vietnam War? Do you think there's, I, in a way I feel like the Vietnam War veterans are still plowing the field. They're still okay. breaking the waves. I mean, they're still figuring out how to get their claims filled at the VA for I medical. feel bad for them trying to get all that shit done. It's so frustrating. And is it going to change? I don't know. You know, I don't know. So what is there to learn from all of this? Don't trust the government. Um, learn from all of it is that uh, what I learned from it is I never believed people believed, and, and I suppose it was naive of me to think that, but I never believed that uh, the, the major television networks for you were used for military propaganda purposes. You know, they'd show the worst of the peace peacekeepers or the peaceful, and they'd show the worst side, and then they show the guys over in Nam. And believe me, if one out of ten wanted to be there, that was a lot. You know, once you see what the hell you're doing there, you say, what am I doing here? You know, sitting here waiting, waiting, waiting for what, you know? It's just like every time. And, and what did we as a country learn from the Vietnam War? I'd say not very much because the French had just gotten their asses kicked over there about 15 years before that. And um, at the same area, you know, that place, I forget, it was, uh, I don't 
know, Den Ben Phu or some damn place that, uh, or Duck Ben Phu or some damn thing, but um, the French got defeated there. You know, France is a big country. So we're doing the same thing over and over. Hmm? So we're doing the same thing over and over? It seems like it. It just seems like it's a big war machine. It seems like everything's built around it. Government's built around it. Unions are built around it. You know? Hmm. I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to know. As crazy as this world's getting with, you know, people like our president and other ones and it's just getting no don't get me wrong i have as much respect for donald trump as sure as hell as i did for obama or that guy that was head of the va when we used to go into superior all the time and see the head of the va was some japanese guy and then it was obama after that and now it's i don't even know if they got trump up in there probably not <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah it it was an experience. It was a learning experience. I'd, a lot of people, I know people that still can't, still got so much anger in them they can't talk to people. They uh, just do erratic shit all the time. And those people I really feel sorry for. Um, I got a good friend like that. I got out of the service, of course. What did I do? I cloned right with them, you know. Then I bought a bar in Grand Rapids and he asked me one day if he, and this guy, you know, he got, he got, he got, just about got his head shot off. And one day he asked me if he could stay upstairs. And he was there for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> eight years and two marriages. <laughs> so, and I laugh about it now because what else am I gonna do? You know, can't change one thing. I just, I just want to have a, little peace in my life and that's what I find out that I'm so glad that meeting is Monday morning at 10 o'clock it just starts my week off and I hear guys say that all the time you know, you know. is there anything else that you feel is important that you'd really uh -huh. like to say about that whole experience and that I didn't give you a chance to say that you feel is important well it's only my opinion I don't think we should have ever been there. I think we should have got out of there rather than escalate in the war when Johnson did it just to get reelected. And then he stepped down. What a jerk. You know, you know the pro war pro protesters weren't letting government be government and it bothered the hell out of them. You know, um, I just think it was, I think. You know, I think about movies like Happy Days. I got to live that kind of a life until I was 18. It was nothing but, you know, fun. And then flying into Cameron Bay there, the first thing I saw was the beautiful sand beaches, the beautiful lush greenery. And as soon as I got off the plane, the first thing I smelled was this big, and nothing but blue sky, big clouds of billowing black smoke. Guys that were bad boys, they made them go clean the shitters out. And the shitters were cutting half 55 gallon cans. You go stir them with a big paddle and pour kerosene in it and light it and burn it. So, yeah, that was the first thing I smelled when I got to Vietnam was burning shit. Fortunately, I never had to do it. I wasn't in that kind of unit, you know. That's why sometimes, you know, in meetings when people talk about shit like that and laugh about it, I feel kind of guilty because I never got I never did that kind of stuff, but but I'm grateful to be here today. I'm, I mean, with that said, I know it's guys like, uh, you know, Dapper and Bob and guys like that, that those guys have a, see guys like me, we would never have reunion, what would we have a reunion about? You know, the, the case on boys have one every year because only about a hundred of them, uh, not very many, got out. Period. You want to read a graphic novel about Vietnam, and that's and that whole battle took place like twenty miles from where the French got their asses kicked right up there on the DMZ. 
it's kind of a strategic point. You got Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam all come together there, and that's that's kind of where I was. I was a we're La Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And then right here on the tip, there was a um, out a command outpost of ours called Tain In, and then we were over here in Benoit, and. You know, some, I remember one time we flew up there. A buddy of mine was, was the G2, he was a captain. Never saw him, but he was my buddy. And um, he was a great guy. One night uh, they had had a, a sapper attack at Tain Inn and they just decorated some gook general or somebody, some diplomat. And the sappers had gotten into the compound the night before and they did something to the helicopter where the helicopter took off. Everybody was right there and the helicopter copter got up about 150, 200 feet and the rotor blade fell off. So we had to go up there and gather up all the information because that one of the guys, I don't know why we had to, we went there at night anyway. Crazy. Sappers. They used to sneak in, you know, some of those compounds were huge. I mean huge. I, yeah, those people live like gophers, you know. Of course, we learned a lot of guys, like those guys I was mentioning, they learned to live like gophers too to survive. You know. No, I don't know that there is a lesson to be learned from Vietnam. It's just take it to heart and try not to let it happen again. You know, and um, what's happened happened. Um, do, I, I think it's important for you to do things like you're doing right here, just to remind people that it it wasn't a, it wasn't as pretty as it seemed it wasn't um hate ashbury over there i can tell you that you know um yeah it just deprived people it deprived one hell of a lot of gi's of the ability to grow up because you were already way past most people that you you know that's the way i feel about it anyway i don't if there's a lesson, it's not a good one, you know. It's just military madness. Well said, sir. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I would. I didn't paint. A, didn't paint a very rosy picture of the, but of the military. But you know what? That's when it went on over there was mass confusion. Even in the you asked the, the combat vets do the same thing. Mass confusion, you know. Yeah, I don't know how you could say it any other way. Well, all I can say is you guys paid the per you paid the uh, price, and you get to be honest. Yeah, I wasn't going to go through it. That filing and disability and shit. I wasn't going to go through it just because I thought, ah, shit. You know, there's people that are got to be a hell of a lot more screwed up than me. But then some, somebody introduced me to um, um, emotional stress and how it. It's just a shame that it had to happen at all. You know. And it would have been nice if they would make it easy for and people. The, and yeah. the problem, the problem was the upper, higher ups didn't know really what was going on on the ground because people lied to them too. Jeez. The platoon guide wanted to make keep his job, and uh, and uh, some guys didn't want their jobs, so they acted accordingly. You, I, I just think there was so much deceit that it was just like a, who told you that? Who told you? I, well, I heard it from one, well, you know. But, it, you know, it was, it had to do with people's lives. We weren't telling jokes, you know. People were dying. I got, I left Vietnam right before, but three or four months before the Easter offensive of 72 or 73, I can't remember. But that was in the works when I was there. We were getting, we were getting intel on that. That there was a, there was a, they were massing up in Cambodia and stuff, you know, and that's well, according to the Vietnam history, we never entered Laos and Cambodia. I know a guy that got shot, got got shot twice in Cambodia. He had a hard time just being recognized as a veteran because he was we weren't supposed to be in Cambodia or Laos. Well, ask those guys that it, were out in the bush how many times they were in Cambodia or Laos. What are you going to do? Guy shooting at you and he's over there, you're gonna go after him? You know, but that's just how crazy it was. You're in the middle of a jungle and they went, oh yeah, you were in Cambodia. 
well, it's one thing if I suppose it'd be a napalm, a whole rubber tree plantation, and maybe that's a little different. But see, that was another thing they heard about out there. All the tree plantations over there, they weren't owned by the gooks, you know. They were owned by Michelin and Firestone and shit like that. And I'll bet anything, if you dig deep enough, you'll find where Firestone and Michigan got money from the government for the, to let that happen. I'll bet anything. Somehow. 